Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you for coming tonight. It's great to see a really good turnout. And uh, you know, sleep health as, as part of well-being is really getting a lot more attention. And uh, more and more, I'm seeing interest in people coming along, wanting to hear a bit about presentations on sleep health and why it's important. And if I tried to do this 10 years ago, I'd probably have maybe two people and a Rottweiler in the room, but now we've got you know 80 people in the room for this sort of thing. So it's really, really good because I think there is a lot more public recognition coming to this field. And we're even starting to get governments interested. So just three years ago, we managed to convince uh, federal government to commit to a parliamentary inquiry into the healthy sleep of Australians. And that was not an easy task for us to convince them to do that because you know, governments, as you might expect, you know, they've got an awful lot of key public health priorities and it's very hard for them to deal with a new kid on the block trying to convince them they've got an extra public health priority to start investing in. So they have been very receptive. I won't say they've been gushing us with money, but at least they've, uh, they've really uh, started to come to a level of recognition. And one of the reasons that the governments are coming around to it and the, and the general public and the communities are coming around to an understanding around sleep is that we could reasonably expect that 40% of people and maybe 40% of people in this room over their lifetimes will have a sleep disorder. So when I talk on sleep topics, I'm usually talking to somebody who either has a sleep disorder or that they're very closely connected to somebody else who does. So it becomes a very relevant uh, topic for most people. Uh, and tonight I'm gonna talk on sleep apnea and I'll have some time to talk a bit about insomnia because they are two of the most prevalent sleep disorders. <laughs> I am happy in question time to just throw it open to any type of sleep problem that, you, that comes to mind. I can probably have a go at most of them. Um, and body clock disorders, particularly among adolescents, is a very uh, other important subject. So if that's something I, I haven't got in my slide preparation, but I can certainly talk to it in, in question time if you wish. And I think we can go to our first slide. So. Um, so this is uh, what sleep apnea is all about. So um, if you take somebody's upper airway on the left that you can see here, uh, we, where the tongue uh, is sitting in, in, a, uh, in that forward position, and the airflow can either work its way through the nose or the mouth uh, and, and down into the lungs through the windpipe or the trachea. In, uh, our upper airways, however, have a lot of circumferential muscles around them and the tongue that sits there uh, is actually a large floppy muscle. As we fall asleep, we lose muscle tone and our tongue and other pharyngeal muscles become rather floppy and that airway can become quite collapsible. And you can see here in the, in the case of somebody who's having obstructive sleep apnea is that that airway can actually occlude. And it's often a transition. So an airway that's narrowing will set up snoring. So that's, uh, that means that the air is uh, being squeezed through a very narrow space in that upper airway right behind the tongue. And the tongue will flutter and the soft palate will flutter and will make that snoring noise. So snoring is uh, telling us that that airway is becoming compromised. However, there is still air moving in and out and people are ventilating and their oxygen levels are usually maintained. Uh, if, however, that tongue was to drop back further and the other muscles around it were to collapse a bit further, that's when we can have this scenario of the occlusion of the upper airway. Now, as you all might imagine, we now have an unsustainable situation. So the person that's doing that is going to need to respond and they'll do so by wakening. And, uh, and in wakening, that episode may be just milliseconds to several seconds long, and that might be all it is. And uh, that would be enough to regain muscle tone, allow that airway to, uh, to reopen, start ventilation again, and that person would go back to sleep. And in most instances, they would have little or no awareness that it occurred. But of course, as soon as they're back to sleep, then they're at risk of the same thing happening again, and this becomes a repetitive cycle. And by this being repeated across the night, and in some instances many times per hour, uh, sometimes 60, 70, even 80 times an hour, we'll see people occlude their airway. 
uh, it leads to significant amounts of sleep fragmentation and as you might imagine a certain percentage of these people will wake feeling very tired uh, and variable degrees of tiredness and drowsiness throughout the day. And one of the key problems of sleep apnea, apart from the noises they may make at night and apart from the concern that they may give to their partners that see these big long apnea episodes or apneic episodes, which is really just a medical word for saying stopping breathing, um, and it can create a lot of apprehension for partners that are observing this, is that non-restorative sleep and all the consequences that may come from that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We can. Um... Okay, you're right there. We just need to change that one over. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so why, why is it that humans are so predisposed to this? So this is a, an upper airway of a human uh, and next to it is a chimpanzee. And humans are particularly prone to sleep apnea because of this really long cylindrical upper airway that we have. And I'll point to it here. Uh, from there all the way down to here is uh, unusually long and cylindrical compared to other animal species. And that is something that developed over many hundreds of thousands of years so that our upper airways can do quite sophisticated things and it allows us to create very sophisticated sounds. So humans phonate, they can uh, communicate in very sophisticated ways and make all kinds of sounds in ways that other animal species cannot. So we have created this long cylindrical uh, airway for communication purposes, but a long cylindrical upper airway is also an unstable upper airway compared to a short stubby upper airway that something like a chimpanzee might have, for example. Uh, now chimpanzees, they can squeal, they can grunt, but they can't make anything like the range of sounds that we can. So that's what we've uh, sacrificed, a stable upper airway for the purposes of communication. And that's the trade-off, is that humans are much more likely to snore, much more likely to uh, occlude their airway at night than most other animal species. So there are some dog species, and the bulldog is the classic example of an animal that can have sleep apnea, but most others it's actually pretty uncommon, or for that matter it might be mild. Next slide. Okay, so this is, this is a typical, I'm going to use a stereotype to then perhaps to some extent dispel the stereotype. So when I grew up in this field, we thought of somebody who's having sleep apnea might look like this chap. First of all, he is a chap. Uh, so there is a male predominance, a little bit older and a little bit rounder than some other people. And that, uh, that extra weight, particularly weight around the upper airway, and it will get into the tongue itself, and it even gets into the soft palate. So the fat tissue finds its way into all kinds of places, which narrows the upper airway. And by narrowing that upper airway, you can imagine that predisposes to it occluding. However, um, I, I think it's important to point out that if you are only looking at somebody like that to try and make a diagnosis of sleep apnea, you're going to miss nearly a third of it. So women uh, have um, sleep apnea commonly, probably about one third of the frequency of men, but that's still being a common condition. It's common amongst women. Um, it is common also in leaner people when they may have some upper airway and anatomical predisposition. So people with just short jaws, for example, uh, might be people that will have a narrow or smaller upper airway and will predispose them to sleep apnea. So we look for all of these sorts of things as well as your conventional sort of uh, weight-related sleep apnea, which, you know, I think it's, you know, as I say, common, but think beyond that because a third of them will not necessarily be overweight. Yeah. Okay, so if you're going to the doctor or, or f even more commonly when in my practice uh, the sleep apnea sufferer is marched in, usually dragged by the ear, by somebody else, okay? most commonly a partner, and um, to have their condition looked at, okay? And we have to stop and think why it is that, uh, that people may choose to come, or for that matter, why a partner may choose or encourage, sometimes strongly encourage their partner to come along and see somebody like myself. Okay, next slide. Okay. And this is the most common, one of the more common reasons is just that snoring is quite disruptive. Uh, it's socially disruptive, 
and, uh, and bothers bad partners. So I'm far more likely to see somebody in my practice turn up be, uh, if they have a partner as, oppo as opposed to somebody who sleeps alone, simply because they just get that encouragement about and that feedback about how loud their snoring might be or for that matter, apnea episodes are observed at night. Um, snoring possibly is not a true health problem, it's a social problem. Uh, so loud snoring all by itself, perhaps in the absence of sleep apnea, if they're able to ventilate sufficiently, but it's just noisy ventilation, is, is often thought of as more of a social concern than a true health concern. There's been some evidence to link just snoring in the absence of sleep apnea with higher rates of stroke and perhaps heart disease, although I don't think the evidence is really stacking up as better data comes through. So think of it more as a social problem, but we do see some snorers that perhaps are just a little tired, even though they may not necessarily have much sleep apnea, and just that loud vibration probably in subtle ways does affect their sleep quality, sometimes in ways that we can't even measure. Um, and, uh, and as a result, we will see a degree of tiredness in these people, and therefore it's, it's important to treat, certainly if they're tired. Um, but, but otherwise, I think we're, our reason to treat this condition uh, is in part in consideration for you know, how disruptive they are to other people. Okay, um, this is the second reason uh, that, I, uh, that we often have people come and see us, is that they're tired and they're often sleepy. And the sleepiness is m often in passive situations, more so than active situations. So for example, if I had sleep apnea and if I was a tired and generally sleepy person, I could probably still reasonably likely stay awake throughout the rest of this presentation. However, if people in the audience have got sleep apnea, you have a much higher chance than me of falling asleep. Okay, we may have the same condition. So sleepiness is very situational, very hard thing to measure if it's highly situational. So a sleepy person in a stimulating context will still generally stay awake. Sleepy person in a more passive or boring or inactive context far more likely to fall asleep. But if it's really severe, it still will actually start to be intrusive, even when they are trying to do more stimulating tasks. But in the workplace, if there are people can be in a meeting, the sorts of questions I ask, in a workplace, what do you like in a meeting? What do you like in a meeting, in particular, if you aren't doing much of the talking? What do you like in a presentation of somebody else? What do you like in a car as a passenger? What do you like, even if you're the driver? Okay, because for many people, driving can be a fairly relaxed and passive task because they're so used to it. Um, not everybody. Some people are concentrate on their driving, and for them, it's a very stimulating task. But many people, it's a passive task, and therefore, they are at risk of falling asleep driving. And and falling asleep at the traffic lights is actually very common, um, more so than in a, uh, and falling asleep on a highway as you might imagine, much more likely than falling asleep around the streets of Glen Ferry. Uh, so, but this is one of the things that I have to spend a lot of my time thinking about, the implications of sleeping not, sleepiness, not just how it may affect performance in the workplace, or, but safety. Uh, and, uh, and, and this was a, a truck driver who did fall asleep and these are the sorts of things that I have to think about with anybody who comes to see me in relation to sleepiness is could they create a safety risk particularly on the road. Uh, and so driving is uh, one of those things that uh, there is an obligation to be fit to drive and, uh, and we have to push the issue a little bit more strongly if we have sleepy people who we believe might be at increased risk of creating this sort of scenario, as you might see. But sleepiness is not just around could you it affect your productivity or your safety or the safety of others. It has a lot of effect on mood. Okay, so tired people are probably not as resilient <coughs> as alert people. Uh, and, and we think that that has an impact on anxiety levels and, and, and mood disorders like depression and so forth. So there are very strong links now between degrees of tiredness and sleepiness and the implications it may have on mood and mood disorders. So, um, so we are in the business of improving people's mental health. 
uh, and very, very important in young people who are sleepy. And we have some young sleep apnea sufferers, but, but young people can be sleepy for other reasons and other conditions too, which we can touch on in question time if you choose. But resilience, uh, I think, is, a real, is very strongly related to fatigue and drowsiness <coughs> levels. So that's one of our goals. And the third reason that people might come to see us is the implications around long-term health. So if this occluding of the airway is going on repeatedly at night, just imagine that somebody is standing over you, if you happen to have sleep apnea, with a pillow and just dropping that pillow over your face and holding it there for 20 seconds and then lifting it up and then waiting a little while, then dropping a pillow over your face. That's what sleep apnea is like. And you can imagine it creates a stress response. When people asphyxiate, their oxygen levels will fall. Uh, then they'll have this abrupt arousal. Their blood pressure will go up. Their heart rate will go up in response to that. So you can see each of these episodes of asphyxia causes a stress response. And if this is happening repeatedly across the night, could this have long-term health implications? Uh, and the answer is yes, we most likely, it, it does. It, it, it affects blood pressure, uh, it affects high, uh, heart, the risk of heart disease, and later in life, higher rates of stroke. And there's now good emerging evidence to suggest also that it may affect cognitive function later in life. And it makes sense if you stop breathing and your oxygen levels fall, um, neurons or brain cells, they don't like a low oxygen environment. Now, a 30-year-old neuron is pretty resilient and can probably cope with it. What about a 70-year-old neuron or an 80-year-old neuron? And there is some evidence to suggest that you can increase rates of neuronal death uh, later in life with sleep apnea, particularly if the oxygen levels are dropping a long way. So this slide here is a graph of, um, that looks at the longer term survival of those that have severe sleep apnea and compares mild sleep apnea as a group, snorers without sleep apnea as a group, and healthy people that neither have sleep apnea and, and snore. And I'll go one side or another, but you can see all of those other groups, their longer term death rate, as shown here, and time over here, cluster together. So the, the likelihood of these people Dying of any cause uh, is rather clustered together, but this group over here is severe sleep apnea. So we, uh, so we would suggest that the moderate through to the severe end of sleep apnea has higher rates of cardiovascular disease and as a result higher rates of death, more so than just the snorers or the snorers with very mild sleep apnea. So if we're treating for longer term health, we might suggest that the moderates to severes are the ones that we might target. Uh, if we're going to treat mild ones, it probably is a little bit more around assessing the extent to which the related snoring is disruptive to others, the extent to which mild sleep apnea might, making people, might make people tired. And it does. So mild sleep apnea can still make people quite tired and drowsy during the day in some circumstances. There's a lot of variability in that. But the more severe the sleep apnea, the more likely you are indeed to be tired and drowsy during the day. Next slide. Okay, so if we're looking at sleep, this is a conventional way of investigating for sleep apnea, and it's a bit cumbersome. We have to ask people to sleep over for a night, and we stick a whole bunch of wires and bands, and, uh, and then we ask them to peacefully go off to sleep, <laughs> and we'll wake you up in the morning, and uh, you'll enjoy the experience and have a great night out. And, uh, and I'm sure there's people in this room that have had sleep tests, and if you have, you probably haven't quite seen it that way. There's a lot of stuff that's stuck on you. It's, uh, it is disruptive to the sleep. It seems a bit ridiculous that the very thing that we're trying to measure is interfered with by all the stuff that we put all over you. But that's how we've conventionally done it. Uh, uh, historically, it was always come into a facility or a hospital and have all of this stuff put all over you, and we'll monitor your brainwave activity, Bands around the chest will measure your ventilation, little breathing uh, measurements just that sit under the nose. You can't see there, but there's a little probe that sits on the finger which measures oxygen levels and heart rate and body position. So there's a lot of information that we get from these tests, but, but for the customer, it's a lot of stuff put on them and they don't especially enjoy the experience. So if I've had 
somebody who's had one of these before and I'm suggesting they need another one, it's a bit of a pitch. They don't want to come back because they don't really feel that they sleep as well as normal. But we can, in, we can make an allowance for that and, and we very, you, very usually will get a, a satisfactory result even though people may perceive they don't sleep as well as they would in their home setting. And there are portable systems now whereby these can be done in the home. Still lots of bits and pieces stuck on, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it is simplified if it can be done in the home context. But there is hope, if we, next slide, we're of uh, making this easier again, and some of the newer technologies out are, are condensing a whole sleep test into something like that that sits on your finger. And this device is actually available currently and there are other devices similar to it and it just measures oxygen level and pulse rate and one or two other fancy signals on the finger alone. And it makes an interpretation from the, how the pulse rate works as to whether this person's awake or asleep and even attempts to work out what stage of sleep they might be from the pulse rate. Uh, and they can measure pulse rate and oxygen levels and estimate the likelihood of somebody actually having sleep apnea from something as simple as this. So this might be our future and uh, we think that we can convince people to do this test uh, more readily than the full laboratory test. They're not quite as good yet. I mean, these are, they do make some estimates and some inferences, so they're not as accurate, but they probably are a little bit of a step forward for a lot of people. Okay, so. If you've, um, if you've had your, uh, uh, you've seen the, 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 the GP or the specialist, you have a diagnosis of sleep apnea, and we would think about why are we going to treat this? Is it something to do about the disruptive nature of the snoring? Is it something to do with the symptoms of non-restorative sleep, drowsiness and fatigue? Do we think it's severe enough to uh, impact your long-term health risk. And they're the three fundamental things going through my mind when I decide we're going to treat this condition. There is a little bit of over-treatment in you know, a milder forms of sleep apnea that are perhaps not that symptomatic. Maybe they live by themselves. Maybe nobody's complaining about the snoring. Maybe the health risks aren't that severe. Sometimes we may not always need to treat those, but there can be a bit of a tendency to still want to treat them. So keep that in your mind. Even ask yourselves or if it's relevant to you or you know somebody, think about why you would want to have this condition treated. And then we can talk a little bit briefly about what sort of treatments there are. This is the most well-known treatment. So these are called CPAP machines, continuous positive airway pressure devices. So that little mask that's sitting on the nose attached to an air pump on the bedside table and it is just room air, just sucked out and delivered under a little bit of pressure. And that pressurised air going into that airway will literally expand or effectively inflate that upper airway and prevent that airway from occluding. So I would practically guarantee 98% of patients with sleep apnea, I would say to them, we're hooked up to one of these devices, you will stop snoring almost completely, and the apneas or the airway occlusions would stop almost completely. So it's extremely effective. So, uh, so doctors like treatments that work. It's fair to say not every patient who comes through the rooms is jumping out of their skin to get hooked up to one of these devices. It's pretty cumbersome. So you've got to think through this fairly carefully. Is this the right treatment? Is the problem severe enough to go to this kind of trouble to be hooked up to one of these devices? If the symptoms are significant, the patients do like it. They're always ambivalent to start with. They're always guarded. It's always a bit of a give it a go and rent one and have a shot for just a few weeks. But if the, if the patients are quite symptomatic and they suddenly wake up the next day and it's the first time sometimes in years they actually feel like they've had a good night's sleep, they will take to it pretty quickly. Um, and then forget all the cosmetic implications of this and the hassles of carting these things around, they feel better and, uh, and it sort of can make the world of difference. For those that aren't terribly symptomatic, and we do see that, people sometimes even fairly severe, and they're not terribly tired. It is, it is a little bit harder to convince people that this is the solution for them. And we have to look at other options. And things like this is a little mouth guard. So these, are, these devices are usually made up by dentists and they, they sit on the teeth like a, it's like a, a, a mouth guard that 
uh, uh, somebody might wear playing sport to protect the teeth, but it's got an upper and a lower dentition. It's just designed to reposition the bottom jaw slightly forward, and the tongue being attached to the bottom jaw is pulled forward and will actually create a little bit of room at the back of the throat. And in doing so, reduce the likelihood of snoring and sleep apnea. And these can work really well for mild, moderate sleep apnea sufferers and snorers, but it's not terribly good for severe. It's just we just can't get enough jaw advancement for the severe ones to overcome that occlusion. So we're cautious about who we may select for this, but they certainly can work for a, for a sizable number of people. Next slide. And don't think about other things which I haven't touched on. Is there, That's a big set of tonsils there. And, uh, and sometimes we get 16-year-olds that are snoring furiously and they're lean. And we think, what's going on? Let's have a look down their throat. And we might see something like this. So it's not the tongue that's doing all the occluding of the airway. It's those fat tonsils that you can see. So tonsillectomies can work really well for snorers and sleep apnea. So we always make sure we have a good look down there. And we will recommend take the tonsils out if we think that that's what the cause is. Next slide. Okay, weight loss. Okay, so body weight um, is, uh, is something that significantly contributes to sleep apnea risk and progression over time. Weight loss is hard. It's uh, for the number of times I've had the discussion, you know, every now and then we get somebody that's done a fantastic job with weight loss through diet and exercise, but it's, it's really tricky. People, when you put on a bit of weight, it resets the whole system. And it's almost like we want to just maintain this weight. Every time you, diet, the metabolism adjusts to try and get you back up to that weight you started at. It's extremely difficult to maintain weight loss. Um, but 10% is achievable. Uh, much more than that, it's really hard work. 10% of weight loss, that is. And so we look at other things, and that's where bariatric surgery, so things about lap bands and gastric sleeves have become increasingly popular in the last 15 or so years because they work. But again, it's a, big, it's a big procedure and it's not without risk. And there might be evidence to suggest that 15 or so years on, these things, that weight does start to work its way back up again, although they are very effective for a good while. And there's some new drugs on the scene. Many of you will have heard about Zempic and, and similar drugs to that, which is now actually uh, so popular we can't get them in Australia. But um, it is probably the most exciting weight loss drug that we've had to work with for, for well, ever, um, and we might see on average eight to 10 kilos weight loss with, with, with that injectable medication once a week. Um, watch this space, it's, uh, not a, it's not available in the pharmacies anymore and I'm not sure when it's coming back. They promised March, but they could be talking March next year. Next slide. <laughs> Okay, and alcohol reduction is, uh, alcohol is a muscle relaxant, so we don't tell tea, people they have to be teetotalers, but just we do encourage people to um, just be drink in moderation, particularly if you're a known snorer and we think that you've got sleep apnea. Next slide. Okay, and finally, body repositioning. So if you think the tongue's dropping backwards, uh, and many people will know this, the snorers are worse on their back than on their side, and that's, uh, and that's the same with people who occlude their airway completely with an apnea. Often it's worse on the back than the side, and there are devices that can be used to keep people in a side-on position. When I first entered this game, it was just get a tennis ball, stick it in a sock, wear a T-shirt, safety pin that sock to the T-shirt right in the middle of the back and then you've got a tennis ball sitting there. And that generally keeps you off your back, so that works. And there are other de commercial devices like big cushions that you can wear, and there are now even uh, electronic devices that work as body position sensors that will actually buzz or vibrate or something like that to, uh, to when you get onto your back and tip your back onto your side. And they work quite well. Um, some people like them. I won't say that they're enormously popular, but it is one of the options that we do run through with people. Next slide. So I'm going to wind up on sleep apnea and I'm just going to, if I've got time, can talk a little bit about uh, insomnia or talk a bit about it in question time if you like. So it's a really common problem. So we might say 5 to 10% of the adult population can be expected to have sleep apnea. That's how common it is. 
If we're going to treat it, think about why we're going to treat it. Is, it. is it because of its disruption to others? Is it because of the daytime symptoms of fatigue and drowsiness and the risks that, it, that that entails? Or are we concerned about the long-term health? We don't treat it just because it's there. We try and encourage our doctors to actually say, hang on, get back to why we're treating it and then move from that position, not just the number on the page. But it is fair to say doctors are guilty of seeing something and then feeling compelled to treat it. But um, you can hold them to account next time you go there and say, hang on, why are we doing this? I'm going to talk a little bit, just a few minutes about insomnia and I'll just race through it pretty quickly um, because it's, it's probably our second most common sleep disturbance that I would see. Uh, insomnia is interesting that the vast majority of people who suffer from insomnia will not get help or if they get help, they might go to the GP or they might go to um, a store and just get some natural sedatives or something like that. So some self-help strategies, perhaps a visit to the GP, but as a specialist in this area, it uh, always surprises me, uh, I, you know, the number of, well, I suppose that the, the, you know, the, the, we're really only just seeing a fraction of the problem that are finding their way to us. So people really do just put up with this problem, uh, not necessarily convinced or aware of what solutions might be in play. So I see predominantly the chronic insomnias, so they're the ones that would have symptoms of difficulty getting off to sleep or maintaining sleep when there is opportunity to sleep. So these are, these are not the people that are just spending not enough time in bed because they're out and about on a Saturday night and having a late night. We're talking about people that are in bed but can't sleep um, for a period of that night. And it would have to be three nights a week and a chronic insomnia sufferer would mean that it has to have been going on for three months. Next slide. And there's, there's a model that's been described which uh, explains why this might actually uh, arise in predisposed individuals and there's three components there is in fact the, the, the predisposing factors the um, precipitating and then finally the perpetuating factors and I'll just quickly go through those um, so these are the ruminators. So these are the people that spend a lot of time thinking about things that, uh, and we all do it, and some of us do it more than others, but um, you know, that sort of, you know, thinking about the day that's just gone, thinking about the week or the month or, or what's on tomorrow or what's on next week, whatever it might be, uh, rumination is one of the predisposing factors for uh, having difficulty either getting off or maintaining sleep. Next slide. Okay, a stressful event, okay, can be a precipitating factor. And this is the most common scenario that I see is in a predisposed person, something happens. They might lose their job, they might have um, a, a relationship breakdown, they could have a car accident. It could be just a, a single one-off event, whatever it might be. But of course it creates stress. Anybody who's stressed will have more difficulty falling asleep or maintaining sleep. That's quite normal. <coughs> Many or most will make a recovery from that over time and you would expect their sleep would be, therefore be restored. So when you're treating those short-term insomnias, that's where medication can be quite useful. And I think that's what medication is really designed for, people with stress, short-term insomnia, short-term use of medication can be quite effective and there is less fear or worry that this will turn into a long-term strategy. However, the, the ones that are likely to see me are exactly that when that happens. So when the, when the insomnia does not go away as the stress goes away though or they get over the stressful scenario but they're left with a persistent insomnia and next slide and that's where we talk about the perpetuating factors what's happened that's caused this insomnia to start to be perpetuating and that's when we start to turn the stress into the stress about sleep itself it starts to be I'm now worried about if I go to bed tonight, will I fall asleep? Or if I wake up, I'm worried now, will I get back to sleep? And I've got all this stuff on tomorrow and I've got this busy schedule, I've got all these things that I've got to pull off and now I can't get back to sleep. So I'm going to actually change the stress to whatever it was beforehand into sleep itself. 
So that sort of, uh, and as you might imagine, then that becomes a self-perpetuating problem, worrying about sleep. I see people that worry about their sleep so much they design their whole daily schedule or redesign their whole schedule around trying to figure out a solution that's going to help them to sleep that subsequent night. Some people even give up their jobs um, because they feel that they just can't do it anymore because of this lack of sleep. So we really try and turn that on its head. Sleep is only there to restore you so that you can be a productive person during the day. We don't want to have people withdraw from their daily activities in order to get some sleep. It's got to be the other way around and we talk to people a little bit about that. And people can sometimes go into their bedroom and think their bed looks like this. You know, this is a dreadful place to be. I hate the bedroom. Some people get anxious going past the bedroom. Okay, so it becomes a conditioned response. Either going to bed or thinking about bed creates a stress response. So you can see how we've now got a perpetuating cycle. And next slide. And. Um, now, excessive time in bed. So if you aren't sleeping well, you are more likely to say, I'm going to go to bed a little bit earlier to give myself my best chance. I might wake up at two or three in the morning and lie awake for two or three hours and then fall back to sleep at five in the morning and you might get two, three, four hours then. Okay? And you think, if I don't get those two extra two or three hours from 5 a.m., I'll just fall to pieces. But guess what that's turned into? That's nine hours in bed in some instances. So I have a simple view. If you are spending nine hours in bed and your body does not need nine hours of sleep, it's this simple. You are going to lie awake and you are going to perpetuate wakefulness because of that extra time in bed. And that's one of our key focuses. The vast majority of people I see with insomnia are in bed more hours than the, than the average in the community. Uh, and we're going to change that. We're going to do something that's quite counterintuitive and make that less hours in bed. Next slide. Okay. Um, now, it's, it's really common. Uh, it's certainly at least as common as, uh, as sleep apnea, but as I say, most people just suffer through this and manage on their own. And uh, next slide. Okay, and I might speed up over that one and go on to um, some treatments. So how do we treat this? So when you, you all hear about the 10 healthy tips for a good night's sleep and some of them can be really helpful, uh, but once it's fairly severe, we have to do some slightly more dramatic things. And one of the things that we really focus on, or two things that we focus on is, is a thing called sleep restriction. So it's reversing this long time in bed. So if you're in bed nine hours, we might make it seven. Sometimes we might even make it six hours. And, uh, and, and that's, quite a shock to people when they come in and they sort of sleep doctor says six hours in bed. It's absolutely the opposite of what you might expect they would be told at a sleep clinic to actually reduce your sleep opportunity. What happens is that we build up a little bit of sleep debt. So we'll go to the next slide if we can. So that might be, those blue bars might be somebody's sleep pattern across the night. Four blocks of sleep and uh, interspersed with periods of wakefulness. Let's just say it might look like that. And let's just say it might be nine hours in bed. Okay, so we're going to then ask this person when they're ready and when they've planned it to reduce that time in bed. Next slide. And we'll put some vertical bars there to indicate when we're going to ask them to go to bed and when we're going to ask them to wake up. And we plan this. We don't say, I want you to start tonight. I said, okay, let's look at your schedule. When are you not too busy? When are you having holidays? When, when can we do this? And I'd rather you do this in two months when you're ready than do it tomorrow night when you're not ready. Okay, because you've got a big schedule. Because we're going to make that person initially more tired than what they currently are if all we're going to do is shorten the time in bed. But we are going to build a little bit of sleep debt and we're going to use that sleep debt to our advantage as it accumulates over about 10 days to 14 days and it builds sleep pressure. Sleep pressure is what we're looking for. We want to make these people a little bit more sleepy as, a, as opposed to the sleep apnea sufferer, we want them to actually build a little bit of sleepiness. Sometimes they say they start getting sleepy during the day. And I'll say, great, that's what I want. I say, I don't want you to actually be sleepy during the day when you're doing things, but it's great to hear that you're building a little bit of sleepiness. Don't have a nap, because that will dissipate and, and we'll lose the effect of it. But hang in there and wait till bedtime 
and we'll actually find it starts to turn into much more continuous sleep at night for a short time in bed. And when that's achieved, and they, people will, there's a lot of psychology in this, they'll suddenly feel, I can do this. I'm back in control. I'm not so fearful about going to bed. It's going to be a short time in bed, but at least I'm starting to have confidence that it'll be mostly sleep. So all of those negative thoughts and associations start to disappear and you can bring it back out. These people will start to increase their time in bed and it will hold together, okay? And at some point down the track, if it unravels again, they've learnt the strategy and they can re-implement it. So if this works really well, I rarely see people again. They, they self-manage this um, if there's another stress or another factor later on that causes their sleep to be disturbed. They just, they just uh, implement this themselves and, um, and it works very, very well. Uh, sleep restriction as a strategy is something that takes a bit of time to talk people through, a bit of time to convince people it's the right thing to do and a bit of planning around, we're gonna make you tired, we're gonna make you feel worse before you feel better and we have to have a strategy around that. So it's a little bit of relationship building between, the patient's got to have confidence that this is a good idea because it wasn't what I was expecting. So you can see how this is hard to implement in a 15 minute GP practice. Uh, it's even, there are online tools that recommend this sort of stuff. And again, that is also hard to be convinced that it's the right solution if it's just an online tool or an app telling you this is what you need to do. So uh, this is possibly one of the reasons why some of the really good strategies around long-term insomnias uh, are not out there broadly applied in the community. So one of my jobs is to sort of, you know, make people a little bit more aware that these sorts of solutions are in place and they're not drugs, it's a behavioural strategy. And it's not even particularly a cognitive strategy. You know, we can do relaxation techniques and meditation techniques and they do help a bit, but they don't help as much as sleep restriction. And that's what we uh, focus a lot on. And we use all the cognitive state around relaxation to supplement that, but it's not the main part of the solution. Short times in bed for insomnia is really what we focus on. And we'll make it complex, we'll get people to follow diaries and, uh, and various other things to actually track whether they're able to maintain this or implement it. But there are some times that we just can't get by without a medication and some people do still need to be supplemented with a medication. So the really severe ones, we don't always succeed with that strategy and, and we will introduce a medication. So when somebody has a medication, we are trying to think, well, who needs one, what type of medication, and how long might we need to use it for, because it could be a long time. And that doesn't always sit well uh, with GPs, pharmacists, or for that matter, even the patients necessarily. Most people come and see me because they're trying to get off medication or avoid medications. But there's a percentage of times we still have to use it, and it's okay. And if we do it in a supervised way, we rarely run into problems, and uh, we try and give people some a little bit of, you know, um, uh, I suppose, permission that this is actually an acceptable strategy and about a quarter of our people that we see with chronic insomnia will still have to be supplemented with some form of medication. But three quarters of them we can get by with just a behavioural strategy and a little bit of some cognitive techniques as well.